Well, good evening. We uh, will go ahead and begin. I know that uh, we have a lot of folks who are going to be live streaming this event. I have received several emails and phone calls about it from folks. They're wanting the address, so we've probably got folks out there, so we welcome not only the folks that are here, but those who are watching with us tonight as well. Let me open up in a word of prayer, and then we will uh, begin the evening. Father, as we come to you tonight, we are first and foremost grateful of the common bond that you give us and the thing that unites us together is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, our desire for there to be uh, continued purity within the church, for the gospel to be unhindered, Lord, in the church by a desire for there to be truthfulness and a desire, Lord, for there to be authenticity among those who are proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Lord, tonight, Lord, as we gather, this is a serious thing because we know, Lord, that there uh, are many people who are watching tonight who are wondering about the topic, maybe wondering about uh, the reason we are addressing it, perhaps even wondering, Lord, about uh, the uh, authenticity of the claims that will be made. Lord, we pray that tonight that truth will triumph. We pray for, uh, Lord, the hearts of those who are allowing the continued controversy to go on because of an unwillingness to call upon uh, Brother Kanner to repent, that tonight, Lord, that there would be uh, a true repentance that would occur in the hearts of all of those, Lord, involved in this situation. Lord, we pray that truth would reign. We pray that this would be a night that we would see the reality of the need for integrity within not just uh, the realm of apologetics but the entire ministry of the gospel altogether. Lord, we pray for Dr. White that you'll give him tonight uh, the ability to speak with clarity, the ability, Lord, to uh, present as he is prepared, Lord, for us to uh, understand the topic at hand and help us, Lord, to see there be um, tonight a change and a desire within all of us to see there to be uh, uh, a repentance, Lord, that comes in the hearts of Canner and others. We pray that this night will glorify you. We know, Lord, that if truth is uh, exemplified tonight and if truth is lifted up, that you will be glorified in that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, let me take just a moment to tell you why, um, as I have talked with Dr. White, I wanted to have an opportunity to host this event. Um, it's been three years since numerous claims came to light where that Dr. Kanner was uh, repeatedly making claims about his Muslim background that have proven to be fabrications, as I believe that you will see clearly tonight. And uh, after uh, Liberty University demoted Dr. Kanner from the position of seminary dean, uh, dean that's when the great cover-up began. It was shocking to me as a pastor. I know it's been shocking to a lot of individuals where that online videos were removed, uh, bios were changed, and the saddest thing is that full repentance never came. And in the last few years, it's grown very silent in one sense or another. Dr. Cantor moved to Arlington Baptist College. He returned or in, and is returning more to the speaking circuit. And it, just back in May, a few months ago, Dr. Cantor tweeted that he had been, and these are his words, found innocent. Uh, he claimed that three schools examined the evidence, found that he was, again, in his words, quote-unquote, exonerated. And then he declared, quote, that he categorically denied the charges and mockingly responded to someone who talked about the videos that were uh, gave the clear evidence of his lies. He said, I also have, he, he mocked by saying, I also have definitive video proving we didn't land on the moon. It saddens me that this has been his response. It saddens me equally or maybe even greater that there are so many who have participated in the cover-up of this. And so tonight really is an interest of the pursuit of truth. There have been claims made that there's only one uh, particular group of people that care about the truth in this and that it happens to be of a, 
a particular doctrinal persuasion, theological persuasion. And I can guarantee you that that ought not to be, that is not what this is about, ought not to be what it's about. If those who are on the uh, both sides of the fence of, of Reformed theology and non-Reformed theology, if we cannot agree on the issue of integrity and truth, what can we agree on? So I think that this is an important issue to be addressed, has nothing to do with uh, reform theology. It has to do completely with whether the claims of Dr. Kanner are true or not true. In addition to that, um, I think that somebody needs to repent. Either those who have uh, are making the claims uh, or Dr. Kanner needs to repent. Somebody needs to repent because there's a divide over this particular issue. I found it also quite proper that, um, or appropriate I should say, that Dr. Kanner gave his uh, same uh, presentation in, behind this pulpit uh, prior to me coming here, and uh, so many of the same fabrications were declared directly from here. And so I think it's quite appropriate to examine these in one of the places where he stood. I also want to say that I had in the past great respect for Dr. Kanner. Uh, after 9-11, I heard his, his testimony uh, as he presented it. Uh, I had read the book that he and his brother uh, wrote, co-wrote, and had great respect for him, had no reason to not respect him, uh, even when he had differing opinions with Reformed theology and, 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 his, and some of the things that he made, regard, uh, claims he made and accusations he made regarding that. That didn't change my view on who he was in the realms of his testimony. But when these things came to light and his response to it, it became just increasingly sad and for, sad for my heart to see anyone who was supposed to be a minister of the gospel to act in such a way. So Dr. White's going to come tonight. He can share with you what uh, his uh, uh, particular reasons are for tonight. I won't speak for him, but I wanted to let you know why that I had agreed to have him come and be a part of this evening. Now tomorrow night we will be want to invite you to that as well at 6.30 tomorrow night. Uh, Dr. White is going to be speaking on what every Christian needs to know about Islam and uh, our whole church, we pray, will be out for that tomorrow night as well to be trained in that. Let me share a little bit with you about Dr. White and I also want to tell you, he hasn't asked for me to do this, this is because I want you to know to check out some of the books that are out there. I've, I actually was excited that I've read almost every one of the books and they've been so helpful to me. Uh, his newest one is What Every Christian Needs to Know About the, uh, the Quran, so you want to get that. Uh, the, the King James Only Controversy is out there, was tremendous uh, eye-opener for me many years ago. Uh, scripture Alone. I think The Forgotten Trinity is one of the best books that I have read in the realms of the Trinity. If you don't have not read this, you need to read it. And uh, if you ha have read other things about it, I think this is a definitive work in many ways. I think you're going to be redoing this as well, updating it, and uh, great book. Um, when I was in Florida and working with uh, uh, Reaching Roman Catholics, I picked this book up, The Roman Catholic Controversy. And one of the things that helps me about this, and this is one of the things I appreciate about Dr. White, is his desire for the pursuit of truth and not just to represent what he believes, but also to represent what others believe accurately so that he can interact with them. And if you, if you need to understand Roman Catholicism, that is there. And then there's the Potter's Freedom. Uh, that is, uh, there's a new revised edition. Of course, this is in response to Chosen but the Free that was written by Norm Geisler. Uh, a great work. Again, uh, you could read numerous amount of people that endorse that. And then I read this several years ago as well, The God Who Justifies. Just found out today this was either your demon or your, your THD work. So I encourage you to look at those. Dr. White is from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, he has a BA from Canyon College, in uh, Grand Canyon College, I should say, in Bible, an MA in Theology at Fuller Theological Seminary, THM in Apologetics from, uh, is it Ferraston? I should have asked you, Ferriston, Ferriston Seminary, a THD in Apologetics from Columbia Evangelical Seminary, as well as a DMN from there. He's an elder at Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church. He's the host of the internet webcast Dividing Line, which I'm sure that many of you listen to. Uh, author of numerous books, I just shared with you some of them. He's debated numerous Muslim scholars. He's going to be traveling to Johannesburg, Africa in just a few weeks 
to participate in numerous debates there with leading Muslim apologists. So we are just privileged to have him with us tonight. And of course, the thing he loves the most, and I'm sure, other than the truth and, and the Lord Jesus Christ, is his family. He's married to Kelly. Two, he has two. They have two children, and one granddaughter, Clementine. Right. And he just came from visiting with them. So I want you to welcome Dr. White tonight. We'll give him the remainder of the time because we don't want to waste any more of that so he can present tonight. Dr. White, thank you for being with us. Well, it is a pleasure to be with you this evening, though I will be honest with you, the uh, topic is not uh, one that uh, is normal for me in any uh, sense. Uh, as was just mentioned, in just a matter of weeks, uh, I will be uh, going to uh, South Africa. And as I go to South Africa, I will be engaging in debates with uh, some of the leading Islamic apologists in the world, specifically Shabir Ali and Yusuf Ismail. Uh, I think their, uh, their plan is to overwhelm me just with the number of debates. We have uh, five debates in about seven days, including a lot of lectures and things like that. So. I would appreciate your prayers, but that is the type of work I'm used to doing, but it's also why I am here uh, this evening. Uh, I'm here this evening because of the fact that this particular subject directly impacts the validity and the integrity of Christian ministry amongst Muslims. Muslims are watching this evening. They know about what's going on here, and they are watching to see how do Christians deal with this subject. Uh, there is a TV program out there called The Dean Show. It is an Islamic production, and very often on the Dean Show, I see people who are supposedly former Christians being presented as experts as to why Christians should become Muslims. And as I listen to these people, I am shocked at their ignorance of the Christian faith. They are former youth pastors and things like that, and we know, uh, we know that youth pastors, uh, that's, that's, that's called the purgatory of, uh, of a ministerial uh, work. And, and uh, people who make claims, and yet when you listen to them speaking, you realize immediately these folks had no earthly idea what the Christian faith was all about. Now they're being presented as experts. And so I have often done videos, I've often done exposés of these people to try to help the Muslims understand that's not what Christianity is about, that's not what we believe. And yet if I'm going to do that, if I'm going to point the finger and say, look, you, you can't trust those folks, when I find people on our side of the divide, doing the same thing in reverse, if I am consistent, if I am truthful, then I am going to have to point that out as well. I'm going to have to say, no, we don't work that way. Christianity has to have a higher standard. And that is why I stand here this evening, because that is exactly what we experience in regards to Ergen Kanner and his claims. But I need to give you the background, and I want to be very open about the background. I first heard about Ergen Kanner in 2005. I was in Inverness, Scotland. My first trip to the United Kingdom. I was ministering uh, up there. Inverness is uh, at the mouth of Loch Ness, so I was looking for Nessie. And uh, uh, I had just spoken at uh, Reformed Baptist Church there in Inverness. And uh, on a Sunday afternoon, I managed to get hold of my email. And someone was telling me, have you seen what's going on in regards to this guy named Ergen Kanner? And I had never heard of Ergen Kanner, and, and so I started looking at what he was saying, and he was attacking Reformed theology in a, in a very vociferous way, but one a, a way that demonstrated to me he really didn't know much about Reformed theology. And so when I got back, I contacted him, and I said, you know, uh, I'd be more than willing to debate you on uh, these issues in light of the claims that you're making. And so for months, we went back and forth. And interestingly enough, the first communication I had with him he asked me a question. He said, is this communication for public or private consumption? I found that odd. I found that strange. Because he was making public comments, and, and I've always thought you need to be you know, open and need to be very uh, honest in your, in your presentations and things like that. So I said, well, public. Uh, this is, I, I want everyone. And, and in fact, we, we posted the entirety of our email conversation so people could see exactly what was being said and uh, exactly what was going on. Well, it was an extremely difficult process, but eventually there was a final agreement to do a four-man debate in October of 2006 at Liberty University in Lynchburg. And uh, people bought plane tickets, we bought plane tickets, uh, we had hotel reservations, the whole nine yards, and, and uh, uh, 
we had a signed agreement. Uh, Emir Kanner signed the agreement. We had the signature, a signed agreement as to what the format was going to be, the whole nine yards. Ten days out, they unilaterally tore up that agreement and completely changed everything that we had agreed to uh, long before that, knowing co completely that we would not allow that to happen. And uh, so the debate that never was was, uh, was canceled. Uh, if they could change all the rules ten days out, they could change the rules the night of the debate. And so it simply never took place. Now, what's interesting then is that after that period of time, uh, after the initial discussions about what had happened, uh, I pretty much forgot about Ergen Kanner. Um, I, I didn't have any reason to be thinking about him. People said, you're just obsessed about this man. Uh, actually, if you look at my blog, between 2007 and 2009, late 2009, there's just almost nothing whatsoever about him at all. He just wasn't on my radar screen. But uh, uh, at that point in time, uh, he had become quite well known. In fact, really 2006 was, was really he hit the peak at that point. I've noticed that a lot of the videos uh, that you'll be seeing this evening, portions of which you'll be seeing this evening, come from 2005, 2006, that time period. And so at this point in time, all I knew was Ergen Kanner was a former Muslim. And I knew he had written books on the subject of Islam. And I assumed that his radical detestation of my theology was due to his Muslim background and him mistakenly thinking that the Islamic doctrine of Qadr, uh, the, the almost fatalistic understanding of God's sovereignty over the world, Allah's sovereignty over the world, was the same thing that we were talking about when we talked about God's sovereignty in Reformed theology as well. And so I just, I, I accepted as a given that Dr. Kanner was a former Muslim and, and this was why, and, and I really didn't know much of the details whatsoever. Well, what was the story he was telling at that particular point in time? Well, we need to know what the Ergen Kanner story was up until February of 2010. What was it that he was claiming for himself until February of 2010? And you'll see why February of 2010 is very important. I want to let him explain that in his own words. And so we are going to watch about a 10-minute video. Uh, this is from uh, Thomas Road Baptist Church in 2006. You'll be able to see the banners that say 50 years. It says 2006 at one point. You can see this. And here is Ergen Kanner. I want you to listen carefully to the story that is being told. Because what has happened since that story has unraveled is... The excuses that have been offered really completely ignore the clear intention of the speaker in making the presentation. So listen carefully to what is being said and how these claims relate to one another. Listen carefully to what Dr. Kanner says as he presents his testimony uh, there at uh, Thomas Road Baptist Church. You'll be able to see right behind him uh, is Jerry Falwell listening to this. Let's listen to what he has to say. Mine just happens to begin from a position of animosity. I hated you. I am 21 generations a Turk. I am the oldest of three sons of an Islamic muazzin. My father, Ajar Mehmet Janer, was in my eyes a giant. He was a man that, that I believed could do anything, played rugby, soccer, any sport where you could kick somebody else. My father was a man. My father feared nothing, but he was devout as a Muslim. And in Turkey, Istanbul, Izmir, we came to America with an express purpose. My father was an architect by trade. And we came to America to build mosques. We went to Moklova, Ohio, Toledo. The largest mosque in the Midwest was there. And having received orders, my dad moved us to Columbus, Ohio, where we began the Islamic Foundation on Broad Street. That's how I got here. I learned English here. I learned culture here. But I was raised devout as a Sunni Muslim. And I hated you. 
Everything we ever knew about Christians, everything we ever knew about Christianity, we learned from the mosque, the masjid, the madrasa, or our imam. Our training, our Sunday school, our pastor. Everything we knew about you, we knew only because we were taught from outside. I had no contact with Christians. I had no contact with Jews because the Quran teaches expressly. Surah 5, take no friends from among the Jews and the Christians for you bring their judgment upon you. That was my world. We came to America having lived in countries where we were always the majority and now I was the minority. We dressed differently, spoke differently, worshipped differently, ate differently, and now we were surrounded by you. This was a difficult adjustment. We were devout. There are two types of Turk who come to America. There are the devout and then there are the not so devout. Let me lay aside some of your worries. I have never in my life ever driven a taxi. I don't have a single silk shirt that I wear open to the navel with my fake gold chains turning my neck green and tangled in my chest hair. I don't slick back my single eyebrow with my designer imposter perfume. I don't have a basket full of snakes, flying carpet, and I don't work at 7-Eleven. <laughs> but there are many of our people who do come to this country and they are not devout. They come here as Muslims casting off Islamic legalism and then they come to America and they become nothing. And I was the second kind. We came suspicious of you. We came devout. Every Muslim on the planet, be they Sunni or Sufi, Shia, Ismaili, be they Nation of Islam, subset of the Sunni, be they Khabi or Alawit, every Muslim knows there are five pillars and six foundations. There is a binadab, salat, zakat, swan, khaj. But all of them can be summarized in one simple concept. Work till you're good enough to make it in heaven. The 23rd chapter of the Quran, Surah 23, verses 102 and 103 say this. He who finds his scales heavy will find perdition. He who finds his scales light will find blessing, paradise. We are taught that from the moment you are born, your mother takes the fig and rubs it in your mouth. Your father whispers the shahada in your ear. And from that moment, every word, every deed, every desire, every motivation, every act, every will, every thought, every emotion, everything goes either on good scales or on bad scales. So that at the end of your life, you've got to have more good than bad to make it into paradise. You have to be 51% righteous. It's why we pray five times a day facing Mecca. It's why we roll out our prayer rug and begin Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Muhammadul ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It's why we live by the dietary restrictions of halal and haram, eating things that are allowable and avoiding the things that are not allowed and avoiding pork, avoiding anything that was like lobster and crab. We did not eat these foods because Allah would hold it against us. And there is only one eternal assurance in Islam, only one eternal absolute. The only people who ever know, according to the words of the Quran, we would read it, kiss it, place it on our forehead, put it on the highest shelf. According to the Quran, according to the Hadith, the only people who would know where they were going to go, the only people who were absolutely sure, were those who died in an act of jihad, in a signed fatwa. You were the martyr. It's why now, five years following 9-11, it's why there's no shortage of my people willing to get on planes. It's why there's no shortage of us willing to do whatever it takes. It's not just an act of devotion, it's an act of desperation. We fear, we fear that we will die with the scales unbalanced. We believe that by shedding our blood and shedding the blood of others, that it'll get us the one thing that eludes us, forgiveness. How I found out that my blood was not needed is the point of this story. It wasn't a massive church. It wasn't a beautiful people. It wasn't a guy on TV hawking Peter and Paul loincloths. It wasn't a magnificent choir. What reached me for the gospel is a series of anonymous, singularly persistent people. One obnoxious boy who wouldn't shut up. One tiny church, one people. 
For three years, Jerry Tackett chased me. I dressed differently, looked differently, yet in Gehanna Lincoln High School, he made me his project. Trying to earn an Awana badge or an RA badge, the guy wouldn't leave me alone. Invited me to everything. Invited me to lock-ins and, 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 and pizza pig-outs and hot dog hog-outs. And, and he kept inviting me and inviting me and inviting me. Three years. No, 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 no. Three years. No, no, no. Finally, I give in. Finally, I tell him I will show him. And I walked into the Stells Road Baptist Church in Columbus, Ohio. A little church that had one aisle. A little church that had 80 people if everybody was skinny. And they loved me to the cross. I lasted four days under that preaching. On Thursday night, during the revival, Clarence preaching his own revival, handkerchief out. I didn't know where the bulletin said I had to come forward. I didn't know I had to wait till we were singing 471 verses of Just As I Am, or <laughs> I Have Decided, or Jesus is Tenderly Calling, or Pass Me Not, or Gently Savior. I stepped out when I thought it was time. I walked up, walked to the front. Clarence, eyes closed, handkerchief out. Looks up. What? <laughs> I said, Isa bin Allah, Jesus is God. I want saved. Yeah. He said, could you wait for the invitation? <laughs> and I said, no. And he spun me around in front of that whole church and led me to Christ right then. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't live by scales. I live by the cross. The reason I tell you that is it was a profound change in my life. He sicked me on a people that loved me. That night, the youth went to Afterglow. That's where everybody goes to Denny's. I hop. And I got to do two things as a new believer in Jesus. I got to tell the waitress I was saved. And I proceeded to order every piece of ham that they had <laughs> on the menu. <laughs> I went home. I did the only thing I knew how to do, which was to tell my father that I was a Christian. November the 4th, 1982. It was the last day I saw my father until right before he died. In 1999, my father died. Three days before he died, I got the call. I flew Jill and Braxton, who was just four months old, up to us, and we stood there for three days trying to witness to our father. He died a confessing Muslim. He died, and it gives me no pleasure to say it, but he died and went to a devil's hell. My friends, it is not a game when we talk about eternity. You can't say, oh, well, all paths lead to the same thing when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It does me no good. It does me no good. It does me no good to ever say, oh, well, maybe God had a back door. He doesn't. I still preach as if my dad is sitting right there listening. I sent him letters five times a year. He never opened the one. But you're here. And some of you in this room, the invitation in your heart is this. You've got family and friends like I do. My father's are the wives, my father's are the kids, my father's family. They're still alive, they're still breathing, and as long as there's breath in the body, there's hope for the soul. So there's the story. At least one portion of it. Let's, uh, let's lay it out and establish a few more parts of it, though you hopefully heard most of it in that particular version of this presentation. First of all, Dr. Kanner, a number of times, claimed to have been born in Istanbul and raised in Turkey. You just heard him talking about how we had always lived in majority Muslim countries, and now I found myself surrounded by you. Uh, here is a place where he specifically makes that claim in regards to being raised in Istanbul. Uh, I was born in Istanbul, Turkey. I'm a sand monkey. Um, been called worse. 
I came to America after going to Beirut and then Cairo. And uh, when I came to America in 1978, at the age of 14 years old, um, I've lived a very urban life. So I have him saying specifically, he was born in Istanbul, Turkey. Now, during the period of time after 9-11, before 9-11, we can't find any evidence of Ergen Kanner ever telling this story. Instead, uh, when you do find, for example, he was involved in counseling people after the Columbine shootings. He was a pastor up in the uh, Colorado area. Uh, he was called Butch Canner. That's, what, that's the name he went by, was, was Butch Canner. But it was after 9-11 that the Ergen Mehmet Canner stuff started and, and all these stories began. But even after 9-11, you can still find places where he said he was born in Sweden. So you have differing stories being told. We'll look a little bit more at that as time goes by. He claimed that he learned English from watching American TV shows like Andy Griffith and the Dukes of Hazard. And uh, here's where he talks about that. Misconception has nothing to do with belief, has nothing to do with truth. I'll give you for instance. Everything I knew about America, I knew through television before I came here. Now, could you imagine? In Turkey, in Turkey, wherever we were watching television, whatever the Turkish government allowed, that was my glimpse of America. And so I would watch that and say, that must be America. The first thing that I remember, that I vividly remember, was a thing called Andy Griffith. You guys know Andy Griffith, right? Loved, loved Andy. But I thought all of America was like Mayberry. And I lived in the city. And there really wasn't a, a you know, that, there's not a lot in common with those two. Um, Dukes of Hazard was another one. Love the Dukes, man. Wanted to marry Daisy and work at the boar's nest. I, I love the Dukes of Hazard. That's this, again, these were not just single times that these statements were made. Uh, we have found numerous uh, recordings of sermons. Well, we found them initially. Uh, there has been clearly a concerted effort since February of 2010 to remove these sermons from the Internet. Of course, hard drives have long memories and uh, so does the internet, and uh, most of us still have copies of these things, but if you go back to the early period of time in 2010 when this controversy broke and look at the links, many of them are now broken. Uh, we have to wonder why that is, why there has been a concerted effort to try to remove these things. Anyways, Dr. Kanner claimed to be a son of an Islamic scholar. He called him an ulima. He was an ulima, which uh, Dr. Kanner interprets as an Islamic scholar. We will see a little bit later on that's slightly off. Uh, he claimed to be trained in jihad in madrasas in Istanbul, Beirut, and Cairo. Now remember in his story at Lynchburg, he said he came in 1978 as he was preparing to go to university. So he presented himself as coming to the United States as a mature individual who had been trained in jihad in multiple places. I mean, Istanbul, Beirut, and Cairo, that sounds pretty impressive. Uh, that's a lot of traveling around in, in majority Muslim countries and being trained specifically in jihad, and that becomes the basis of his authority on Islamic issues. As I said, over and over again, he said, we had always lived in majority Muslim countries. This was the, in almost any sermon he gave, if it turned to his testimony, it would be, look, we came from Turkey, we had been in majority Muslim countries, we didn't know anything about you, we thought you hated us, and then there was this one guy, and he kept witnessing to me and witnessing to me, and I go to this little Baptist church, and I was loved to the cross, and this is, this is the essence of sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon that is delivered over years of time after 2001. It's the very substance of the claims that he was making and the very substance of what made his story so compelling uh, because, as you saw, the man's a good speaker. He can control an audience. He, can, he has good cadence. He's a, he's a clear speaker. He's very entertaining. He has good comedic timing as well. And this would be the essence of what he was saying. He said he came to the United States in 1978, but if you look back at his bio, which was posted on the Liberty website until February of 2010, it said he came in 1979. And there were other sermons where he also gave the date of 1979. So 78, 79, uh, so he is, he is an older teenager. He says he's preparing to go uh, to university at that time. 
And uh, the only English he had learned was from watching Mayberry and Dukes of Hazard and uh, WWF wrestling uh, is another thing that he mentions. He also says that his father was a polygamist and he used the Abraham lie when he came to the United States. Uh, that he brought multiple wives with him. If you listened carefully at the end of what he said there in Lynchburg, you heard him say, my father's wives and their children are still living, right toward the end, if you listen carefully. You caught that. He claimed a number of times that his father had multiple wives and brought them with him. And that he thought all Christians hated him. That he had had no exposure to Christians until he, as an older teenager, and that he had to overcome that uh, prejudice that had been inculcated in him. He said he came to the United States, trained in jihad as a missionary to convert us. In fact, in one of his videos, he, he says, we, we came because the, you know, the Ayatollah Khomeini had said uh, that we would not stop until the United States was a Muslim nation. Now, he's a Sunni Muslim. He was a Sunni Muslim, so why he would be listening to the Ayatollah Khomeini, who is a, a Shiite Ayatollah, I don't know, but that was uh, his claim. He said that he lived as a Muslim, and in fact, he claimed to dress in full Arabic clothing, even in public school. Uh, he called it his dress... Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now what's fascinating about this is that's not how Muslims dress in Turkey. Uh, Muslims in, in, in Turkey do not wear the Arabic kind of garb, uh, so why he'd be wearing it is, uh, is, is a question, but that's what he was claiming. In fact, he even claimed that they would go into the high school bathrooms and roll out their prayer rugs and pray in the high school bathrooms uh, in their Arabic garb and, and, and do the five daily prayers and those prayers that you would have to do during the course of the day. Then, of course, you heard him claim that he was converted at a local Baptist uh, church, that he then went to his father and was disowned by his father and lost his family. Lost his family. He was, in essence, giving that up for uh, the cause of Christ. Uh, uh, then he talk, talks about his father dying, uh, refusing conversion, and that when he died, he, when he went into the room, uh, that his father was surrounded by imams and caliphs. Imams and caliphs were there uh, at his father's death because he was this scholar. Uh, he was an ulema, uh, and he was the one who gave the prayers at, uh, at the mosque. Then he says that after his education, he began doing debates. He began doing debates. And he claimed in printed sources and in interviews that he was a veteran of more than 60 debates against Muslims and more than 75 debates, including other uh, types of individuals, atheists and, and Buddhists and so on and so forth. And one source uh, claimed debates done in Arabic in mosques against imams. So actually debating in the Arabic language uh, against imams. And there were frequent claims uh, to the ability to speak and converse in Arabic. We will listen to a few of those a little bit later on in uh, the presentation. The result of all of this, being one of the, the first seminary, uh, former Muslim seminary presidents, um, especially in, in post-9-11 America, is that he was then, he and his brother, hailed as experts. Uh, for example, and, and this is actually recorded after uh, February of 2010. Uh, John Ankerberg, in uh, introducing the Canner brothers, listen to what he says about them. In fact, we're talking about the truth about Islam and jihad with uh, renowned scholar Dr. Emir Canner, who's probably with his brother the world's foremost uh, scholars on Islam and comparing it with Christianity. I believe that Emir and his brother Ergun, they are the Evangelical scholars, they are they, these are the authority in the world today in terms of this topic of Islam. They've got this Quran and the Hadith absolutely memorized backwards and forwards, as you will hear in a moment. So there you have the kind of uh, description that is given as these men are introduced uh, in their presentation. So there's the story. There's the story as it existed until February of 2010. Now, at this point, I want to take an excursus, shall we say, for a moment, and answer a question, why me? Why am I doing this? My ministry is not about uh, running around and investigating folks. People said, why don't you investigate this controversy or that controversy? I'm a Christian apologist. 
why am I standing here this evening when I have so much else I need to be doing? I just had a book come out. Uh, uh, Brother Buck showed you uh, whatever Christian needs to know about the Quran. I've already moved on to my next book. I am co-authoring a book with Shabir Ali. It is on the Trinity and Tawhid, and I'm behind on it. And I could be doing that tonight. I could be working on that tonight. Why am I standing in front of you? Why have I, my, has my ministry been damaged? Uh, why have I uh, been threatened with legal action? Uh, why am I here this evening? Why me? Well, first and foremost, I need to establish the fact that the primary motivation, and I will expand upon this at the end, is I'm standing behind a pulpit. I can count on two hands with fingers left over the number of people who stood by, behind the pulpit of the Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church. We are very careful, and I consider it an honor to stand behind any man's pulpit, sir. Thank you very much. Ergen Cantor promulgated his story from behind the pulpit of Christian churches. And if it is untrue, if it is false, then every single Christian who is concerned about the integrity of Christian ministry should be concerned about the fact that this man will not repent and that there have been many others who have actively helped him to avoid repentance and continue to do so to this evening. That should concern any Christian. But you see, for me, the reason that I have to do this is because Eric and Canner went around pretending to do what I actually do. I know the men he claimed to debate. And if I find out that someone on my side is making false claims, how can I face them with integrity and truthfulness and debate and say, we Christians believe in the truth, except when we have people on our side that are lying, and then we close our mouths. And so what I felt I needed to do, I am going to dispute the claims of Ergen Canner that he's ever debated any Muslim at all. But I think I have to establish the fact that if I'm going to make that, Disputation. If I'm going to make that argument, I've actually done what he claims to have done. And so I asked Rich Pierce, the president of the ministry, just to put together a little clip. I was a little surprised when I saw it. I've been doing this for a while now. Um, I started debating in August of 1990. I have done almost 130 moderated public debates on most of the continents in the world. I'm just about to add Africa to that list, as I mentioned, in just a few weeks. And I did not start dealing with Islam until 2005. I did do a debate in 1999 with a Muslim, but I had not started studying Islam. I do not really consider that one of my Muslim debates. But I started studying Islam because I was studying the persecuted church. And I started realizing Islamic apologists deal with all the issues that I've dealt with most of my life. Textual criticism, the doctrine of the Trinity, church history. And so I engaged in my first debate with a Muslim knowing something about Islam in May of 2006 with Shabir Ali, who was considered to be, by many, to be the best Islamic apologist that, that is out there. And so what uh, Rich has done for me is, is put together, you'll notice I, I, I need to give you the two reasons, the integrity of Christian ministry and Islamic apologetics in particular, and suddenly Ergen Kanter went about pretending to do exactly what I really do. Um, here's a few minutes. This gives you a listing of the men that I've encountered in chronological order and the debate topics that we have had. In the background is a closing statement I gave in a debate with Sami Zatari and Fullerton. Uh, it's about a 10-minute gospel presentation. It's not going to be 10 minutes here. We cut most of it out. But a 10-minute gospel presentation that, by the way, if you ever get a chance to talk to a Muslim, it's on YouTube. You can direct them to it. It's, uh, it I think it's a, a helpful presentation. But here's just some evidence that when I stand here and say, I need to do this because I actually do what Ergen Kanter went around claiming to do, the evidence is very clear that that is exactly what I've done. And here's the information. Some people want to live in the sound of chapel bells, but I want to run a mission beyond from the gates of hell. This evening. We have heard it said, I don't want an innocent man taking my sin. Well, someone needs to take your sin because you stand before a holy God. The judge has justly condemned the man for his evil deeds. And in comes the judge's son. And the judge's son comes in 
voluntarily. The judge's son is a perfect man. He can actually bear the penalty that is due to someone else. He has no penalty due to himself. And he voluntarily comes. In fact, it was the purpose of the father and the son. That's exactly what would happen. And so he voluntarily comes and out of love bears the penalty of that sin. We're in the middle of a raging war. We've been training for so long. Have we learned to use this toy? We may not be many, but we serve a mighty Lord. And he's made us more than conquerors. So what are you waiting for? Let's run to the battle. He doesn't just leave the man in that condition. The Spirit of God comes and changes his heart. God does not simply transfer my sins to Jesus. He also imputes Jesus' righteousness to me so I can stand before a holy and just God. But he also changes my heart. How often did we hear this evening? The Muslim must do this, and the Muslim must do that. My friend, everything that Sammy this evening has told us he does, and that the Muslim must do, is as filthy rags before a holy God. But the cross, for me, is not justice. It's not fair. It's called mercy. My friend, when you look at the cross of Christ, if you do not see in that cross the wrath of God against sin, you're only seeing a part of the cross. When you look at the cross of Christ, I hope you see God's holy wrath against sin, which is poured out in all its fury upon the substitute Jesus Christ. Because only once you see that dark background can you begin to understand, I have been crucified with Christ. That is the confession of the believer. I've died. I can no longer live my own lusts, my own desires. I've died with him. His death is my death. His burial is my burial. His resurrection is my resurrection. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I live, I live by faith in the Son of God. And listen to these words. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Loved and gave in the heiress. They're referring to a single act. It's the giving of Christ. That demonstrates God's love for us. You ever wonder whether God loves you? God has proven his love for you. God has proven his love for you in a way that could never be questioned. Has Allah proven his love? No. The Muslim has no assurance because he has no mediator. He has none that can stand in his place. He has to stand before a holy God, and he does not know whether that God is going to be merciful. The reason the Christian can believe and know that God is going to be merciful is because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. God accepted his work and raised him to his right hand, and that is our assurance of the gospel. Run to the battle. That, uh, that mosque there at the end is the East London Mosque. It is the largest physical mosque in London. And I debated there uh, on the subject, is Muhammad prophesied in the Bible, one week after the attack on the embassy in Benghazi. And as you may recall, there was uh, rioting going on around the world at that particular point in time. Uh, but we debated there in the mosque and had a very good evening, uh, in fact, uh, that evening. So the reality is uh, I have done what Eric and Canner claims to have done, but has never done. That's why I have to do this. That's why I have to do this. Now, the story began unraveling, as I said, in late 2009, thanks to Twitter. <laughs> what an amazing thing Twitter is. Uh, so much has been said that means absolutely nothing on Twitter, but uh, every once in a while something meaningful sneaks through. And uh, what happened was Eric and Canner tweeted a insult toward reformed folks, and I, I mentioned something about it on my blog. I, I, someone had actually linked me to it, 
and uh, I responded to it on my blog. Uh, as a result, a Muslim by the name of Muhammad Khan contacted me by email and said, have you seen my videos about Ergen Kanner? And I said, no, because I hadn't been thinking about Ergen Kanner. If someone hadn't linked me to what he had said in Twitter, I wouldn't have even given the second thought. But he said, uh, look, at, look at some of my videos. And so I started watching some of these videos, and I was shocked. I mean, I'm a student of Islam. I, I'm not, I don't have enough years left in life to ever become a real expert on Islam because you'd have to spend so many decades to really, there's just so many permutations and so many things you'd have to study. I'm a student of Islam, but as a student of Islam, I was taken aback by the, the, the basic errors, and we're going to talk about some of them, but ju just simple errors that a person who had practiced Islam for 17, 18 years would just never make that he was documenting in Ergen Kanner's talks. And I sort of went, hmm. But I didn't pursue it. Uh, it just wasn't, again, something that was, that was on, my, on my mind. I didn't realize what the full length of his story was. It had never crossed my mind that there was something wrong with his claims in regards to his Islamic background at all. Uh, to be honest with you, I had just come to the conclusion he was a really bad scholar, uh, that he just wasn't fair in his, in, in his, in his study and things like that. Then, in January of 2010, uh, I was sent a link to a radio program that he appeared on with the Calvary Chapel leadership. And he made comments about me. He didn't use my name, but he made it very obvious that there are certain reformed people that have taken over the debating area and so on and so forth and, and uh, turned it into a, a, a playhouse, a jungle, their own personal jungle gym and so on and so forth. And it was just a, a really nasty attack. And so, uh, once again, I, I put up a video responding to it, playing portions of it and refuting it. So, once again, Muhammad Khan contacted me. And I was just about to go to London. Uh, for some of those debates that we just noticed, uh, that we just noted, and Muhammad Khan said, "Did you know that Ergen Kanner has claimed to de have debated Shabir Ali?" Now, as of this day, I've debated Shabir Ali five times in the United States, the mosque in Toronto, and a couple of times in London. And as I said, we'll be debating in Johannesburg in just a few weeks, which will make our sixth and seventh times. And I wrote back to him and said, "You'd have to prove that to me." And so while I was between planes in Philadelphia about to board the, uh, the overnight flight to Heathrow, uh, I got an email uh, back then on my BlackBerry. Does anyone still use those? Um, and uh, uh, it was Muhammad Khan saying, here's the link to the YouTube video. Well, I couldn't watch it at that time, but once I got to uh, Wandsworth in London, I got it, uh, settled in my hotel uh, just, just off the Thames. You can see, actually, I could actually see the Thames from what, where I was sitting in my hotel that day. Uh, I got an opportunity to uh, look at this video, uh, which is not really a video. It's, it's an audio of two times in 2007 where Ergen Kanner claimed to have debated Shabir Ali. You need to listen to this because this is really where this controversy began. So here's what I listened to and what I watched in my hotel room there in London in uh, February now of 2010. Race and the atonement. Every debate, um, Abdul Salib, Nadir Ahmed, Shabir Ali, every debate I've had with these men, they always end at the same point. So what if Jesus did die? Because the Quran teaches somebody died. So what if Jesus did die? What's that matter to me? Radically redefined grace with Allah simply means he does not kill you. Mm -hmm. He allows you life, and that's grace. There is no such thing as grace being unmerited favor given to one who could not do for himself. You can do for yourself in Islam. One of the number one lines that Shabir Ali, the Muslim apologist, give, gave me at a, a debate which took place in Nebraska was, why does one man have to die for me? What does one man's death have to do with my life? And this is Islam. Now, as soon as I heard that, the red flags started popping up in my mind. The red flags, a debate in Nebraska? I mean, I actually have debated in Nebraska, but not with Muslim. Um, and I, it just didn't strike me that that was a place that Shabir Ali would be going to, to do uh, debates. And then the main thing was, that the reason I knew immediately that there was dishonesty in Ergen Kanner's words was because of who he mentioned. 
He mentioned Nader Ahmed. Nader Ahmed and I did debate. Nader Ahmed is really not stable. I will never debate him again. He actually showed up at my church on a Sunday night to challenge me to debate at the Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church. When we debated in Norfolk, the Muslims were yelling at him from the audience by the end of the evening. They were so disgusted with him. It was that bad. No one should ever debate Nader Ahmed because he's not worthy of, of, of a debate, quite honest with you. But I knew, I had seen on Ergen Kanner's website, the, the entire exchange that he had had with Nader Ahmed, and it had nothing to do with this subject at all. But then there was this name. Did you catch it? Abdul Salib. When I debate men like Nader Ahmed, Abdul Salib, and Shabir Ali, Abdul Salib? Have any of you read Norman Geiser's book on Islam? Who's the co-author? Abdul Salib. Abdul Salib in Arabic means servant of the cross. Abdul Salib is a Christian. I happen to know who Abdul Salib is. I know him personally. In fact, if you look at my book, he endorsed my book. Why would Ergen Kanner debate Abdul Salib? And why would Abdul Salib say the things that Ergen Kanner said he said? Immediately I knew he's making this up. He's making it up on the fly. Well, one problem for Ergen Kanner is I know Shabir Ali and I have his email address. And so I immediately wrote to Shabir. And ironically, that day, he got back to me within 20 minutes. Shabir is not a big tech guy. He's not a big email guy. So I had actually sort of figured I wasn't going to hear from him for a few days. But he got back to me within about 20 minutes. And I wrote to him, and I said, Shabir, have you ever debated Ergen Kanner? And his response was short and to the point. Not only have I never debated Ergen Kanner, I've never met Ergen Kanner. So what did I do? Well, I contacted Ergen Kanner. I went back into my archives. I had plenty of email addresses from back in the 2006 debacle. And I used all of them, and one of them got through. And I said, Dr. Kanner, uh, here's the URL to a video I want you to watch. In it, you claim twice to have debated Shabir Ali. Here's Shabir Ali's response to that. Could you explain this to me? So he got back. And interestingly enough, the first thing he said to me was, is this private or public? First thing, first thing. And my response was, it's as public as your statements were. So he responded and said, I misspoke. It wasn't Shabir Ali. Well, I can understand that. I mean, now, if someone speaks Arabic, Arabic names shouldn't be all that difficult. But for those of us who don't, if you saw the names of the men that I've debated, uh, I think you could forgive me if I confused Zulfiqar Ali Shah and Imam Shamsi Ali, and Shabir Ali, and Abdullah Al-Andalusi, and Abdullah Kunda, and so on and so forth. I mean, that would be understandable. So what would be the first thought across your mind if you say, well, I misspoke? You know what my immediate response was? OK, that's understandable. So who did you debate in Nebraska? That was the last I heard from Ergen Kanner. Next day, an apology appeared for about 10 days on Ergen Kanner's blog. It only appeared for about 10 days, then it was taken down in which he admitted that he had misspoken about debating, and he didn't give a name. He didn't even bother to say it was Shabir Ali. He said he had misspoken, and that, you know, when preachers stand behind pulpits, he said, you know, I make a lot of mistakes behind the pulpit. I, 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 I you know, I, I might even uh, forget my kids' names once in a while. You know, you just get preaching so fast, and it was just all just, it's just misstatements. It didn't explain why Nader Ahmed and him never said those things, and why did you debate a Christian named Abdul Salib? Didn't want to talk about any of that. He just apologized for having misnamed Shabir Ali without naming who he was. Well, that was enough to get all of us going, hmm. And so the research began. Myself, we started looking at the rest of Muhammad Khan's videos. And other people associated with my ministry, primarily in what we call our chat channel. We have an IRC chat channel. It's sort of old technology, but it's a way we communicate with folks all around the world. And there's some really smart people in that channel. They started, uh, they know how to use Google, and they started looking around. And so the research begins, and we started encountering troubling inconsistencies in Canner's time frame. 
he would talk about how he couldn't be president, but his brother could, but there was only four years between them. But uh, if, if his brother was born in the United States and there was only four years between them, then how could he be as old as he said he was? And he came in 79 and, and the ages didn't add up. And there was about a 10 year problem and we started seeing problems. And then we started seeing there were inconsistencies between Ergen and Emir's stories when they weren't together. They were telling different versions of the story and they didn't match up time-wise. And, and then we discovered there were all sorts of inconsistencies depending upon the audience. In fact, one of the things that has troubled me the most is that after 9-11, when you have Ergen Kanner giving the kind of presentation we heard him saying, I'm born in Istanbul and raised in Turkey and thought you hated me and all the rest of that stuff. When he was interviewed by a Turkish newspaper, you know what he said to the Turkish newspaper? Right in between, we can document that before this and after this, standing behind pulpits, he tells the story, raised in Turkey, jihad, la la la. When he talks to a Turkish newspaper, I came here in 1969 before I was three. And I was born in Sweden. Folks, when you tell someone who can check you out one story, while you're telling other folks that you don't figure will check you out a different story, that's called lying. That is the only definition of the term lying, is inconsistency. And then a man in my chat channel, a man who has worked for a private detective in the past, said, well, you know what? According to their own books, the canner's parents were divorced. That means those divorce papers are public record. And he found them. And those divorce papers contain all the information about when the canners came, where they lived, ages of the children, everything is laid out in those particular divorce papers. And that's when the documentation started coming together. A few months ago, I got an, a uh, notice from YouTube that one of my videos on Ergen Canner had been taken down due to a DCMA request. They, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, DMCA, that's right. That Ergen Canner, through someone else, had made a claim that I was violating copyright. So we made a counterclaim, and it's been restored, and no counterclaim to that has been filed. I want to show you the suppressed video. Not only will it show that Canner more than once told the same story, but now I'm going to start and stop it in the video. I'm not going to do it up here. And I'm going to give you the facts in response to the claims he was making. This was an apologetics conference in 2006. So right around the same time as when he spoke at uh, Thomas Road Baptist Church. I have spoken to the man who runs the ministry, who hence owns the copyright to this. Uh, he was not the one who filed the claim. And uh, uh, so obviously there's been sh some chicanery going on in the legal realm, shall we say. But I want you to see this, this video that Eric and Kanner didn't want you to see. And I think the only reason they went after this one is because I don't actually appear in it. I just put the information up in text form. Let's take a look at this video. But, um, I cannot, be, uh, I cannot be president. I, I came in 1978 when I was getting ready to go to college. If you would have heard that it was an immigrant, some of us struggle because you see my brethren get up to speak and it's very difficult to follow our cadence. I am being very happy to be here. Thank you so much. You know. Let me read that for you. It came to the U.S. in 1969. All legal documentation confirms this date. Is this a mere misstatement again? I'm a Yankee. I'm an urbanite. I live in the country now, but I have my entire life lived in the cement jungle. I've been an inner city person. I learned English on Sesame Street. Uh, held back a year from school so that I could learn English, so I could follow along better. Eric and Canada lived in Ohio from before his third birthday. Another um, misstatement? To lay aside some of your misconceptions, just in case. You'll have heard this before. I have never in my life ever driven a taxi. Not once. 
I don't work at 7-Eleven. I don't own a basket full of snakes. I don't have a flying carpet. Why would he? He was born in Sweden. No evidence exists he ever lived in Turkey. <laughs> Do you know why? Why am I able to joke like this? Because there is nothing. I am an equal opportunity offender. It is offensive. There is it. nothing off limits for me. With the exception of this day and tomorrow, I, I'm in a hostile crowd all the way for the next 17 days. Listen to this. And I like my life that way. I go into state universities and community colleges. I invite cults onto our campus, and we debate all the time. I do it because I believe Christianity has nothing to hide from the world. We have nothing to fear from philosophy. And that vain babblings sometimes need to be smacked out. I hated you. That may be harsh, but as Dr. Hayes told you, I was my madrasa, my training center was in Beirut. Karen Before I came to America, until he was two and a half, and he lived in Ohio. To claims a myth. My father was a muazin, uh, the one who does the prayer in the mosque. He did do that. Five times a day, he would climb to the top of a minaret and begin, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And he would do the call to prayer. He was also an architect. So we built mosques, and so we came to America. It was 78. Ayatollah Khomeini had said, we will not stop till America is an Islamic nation, and we came, and we continue to come. Anything I knew about Christianity, I learned through misconception and caricature. I knew nothing about you, had never been in a church, had never been outside the mosque. Anything I knew about you, I learned either through television, hyperbole, gossip. But I did know this, I hated you and I thought you hated me. Muslims live in enclaves. We travel together because this is necessary for us. It is necessary for us because we live differently, dress differently, look differently. I was the oldest. My father brought his wives with him. Yes. Wives, wives, Polygamous yes. Muslims do come to America. We call it the Abraham lie. They say, this is my wife and this is my sister. And everybody goes, aren't they still family oriented? Yeah. And we moved from Brooklyn, New York, near the Verrazano Bridge, to Toledo, Ohio. Toledo, Ohio, to Columbus, Ohio. And it was there where my father built the mosque, working with the other Muslims. Now it's different than the way we do it here in America. And it's different than the way the church does it. You all know how we do it in the church when we're going to build something. We get together and we get a slogan. Somebody gets a slogan and we gather the people together and show them a blueprint. Then somebody draws a thermometer. And we... And we fill it in. But in Islam, it is the exact opposite. There is no mosque that is built with inside money. All mosques are built with outside money. And so the money is provided, the mosque is built, and then they say, it is built. Now you must come. And so I, as a high school boy, moved to Gehenna, Ohio. And there in Gehenna, Ohio, as my father labored as an architect, as we began working on the mosque, I was surrounded by Christians. At least that's what I thought. It's why we roll out our prayer rugs in the high school bathroom and face Mecca. It's the reason we live by the dietary restrictions of halal and haram. It's, it's the reason we fast during Ramadan until the Eid al-Fatir, until the, until the end of the day when the sun sets and iftar and then we eat again. Why? Because we are terrified. That's why there's no shortage of us willing to get on planes. Because there is only one eternal assurance in Islam. I'm now approaching 75 Islamic debates. I have two more before the end of the semester. One with a Shia, one with a Sufi. And I have never met one who has ever disputed this. Ever. There is only one absolute in Islam. Even Muhammad said he did not know where he was going to go when he died. But if you die as the martyr, in a declared fatwa, in an act of jihad, 
highest level of heaven. There's no roller skating in sand. Not much sand in Ohio either. Want to come to the pizza pig out, the hot dog hog out? No. I will show them. And I walked into the Stells Road Missionary Baptist Church in Columbus, Ohio, in full gear, full gefia, and a Quran. Ergen Kanner in high school from his yearbook. Hmm. Looks very Arabic. Oh, there's some more. Doesn't look very Arabic to me. There he is in a play. Uh, hmm. I went home. I told my father. Abi. He's a messiah. Jesus is Messiah. The Quran says that. My father faced Mecca and prayed the prayer of disownment. And it was done. That was the last I saw my father. She got saved and in the baptistry took off her gefia, took off her ador. She's a church planter in Elephant Butte, New Mexico. Because of one, because of one people, one tenacious people. And then I'm, I live for apologetics. Let me tell you what the last two weeks of my life have been. I got hit with oranges in a debate. Yeah, don't awe. That's, it's sort of funny. <laughs> you get hit with an orange, you're like, tomatoes are softer. What are you, stupid? <laughs> On Thursday night, I debated two Mormons. Next Thursday, I'm debating the, the, uh, the chaplain for the Metropolitan Community Church, the gay churches. I love hostile crowds. I love that. You know what? If you ever hear I leave Liberty University, you know where I would go? It ain't going to be to go to seminary. I think we got it wrong. We all think that if I can get to the seminary, it's the greatest thing in the world. No! I love the seminary. Don't get me wrong. But I don't want to spend my whole day surrounded by Christians. What is the difference between a misstatement and a lie? That is a question that I think needs to be uh, answered. And I think the next screen, briefly, before we move on, asks, how many times can you repeat a misstatement before it is a lie? Well, what's the true story? Ergen Kanner was born in Stockholm, Sweden moved directly to the United States before his third birthday. He never lived in a majority Muslim country. There may be Muslim, lots of Muslims in Sweden today, but there weren't all that many in the late 1960s. He grew up in Ohio. His father was an architect involved in the local mosque, as he said. But his father was the non-custodial parent by eight years of age in, Maha in, uh, in Ergens. Uh, experience. So the divorce is while the boys were very young. There is no evidence provided of even visiting Beirut or Cairo, let alone training there. The divorce papers include the fact that the boys are to remain in the Islamic faith, but the divorce papers also forbid international travel, which is rather interesting. There seems to be some indication that Aaron Kanner might have visited Turkey might have visited Turkey, but you've listened to him a number of times now. That's not what he said. He didn't say, I visited Turkey. He said, I lived there. That was my culture. That was my people. That's where I was trained, and that's why I knew nothing about you. Did you hear him talking about, I, I, I knew nothing about Christians. How many teachers in the Ohio public school system were Christians in the early 1970s? How many of his fellow students were Christians? A large part. A large part. Obviously. You heard him talk about the Abraham lie. Absolutely no evidence of polygamy has ever been produced. And as we're going to see, in the excuse sheet that has been produced by the canners, they admit that their father was not a polygamist, but they excuse Ergen's statement by saying, but he did remarry, so he had more than one wife. So that means all, everyone who is divorced is a polygamist from that perspective. And again, that's not what he said in the presentation, as, as we will see. 
Obviously, as we saw briefly in the video, photos of Ergen Kanner do not support his assertion of wearing Islamic or Arabic clothing each day in school, as he claimed. You saw these pictures, his uh, four pictures from his high school uh, yearbook. It doesn't look like uh, he's doing the Islamic thing there. Clearly, Kanner learned English in the Ohio school system, hence his lack of accent. He does speak a foreign language. It's called Swedish. Uh, because his grandmother moved with them, and she continued to uh, speak Swedish, and so he can he can say a few things in Swedish. Kanner clearly exposed to Christian teachers and students throughout his youth. His entire "I thought you hated me" thing has absolutely no validity whatsoever. Um, there are numerous contradictions in spoken and printed sources regarding even the date of his conversion and the conversion of his brothers. That should trouble us as well. There is no evidence of any formal debates in English or Arabic with Muslim leaders. Evidently for Ergen Kanner, if he talks with a Muslim in a cab on the way to the airport, that's a debate. Seriously, uh, that, that, that counts as a debate. If that's the case, I've had about 12,000 uh, debates because I've done a lot of witnessing over the, uh, over the years. Um, for him, debates equal discussions, talks, interviews, things like that. Uh, he speaks some Swedish, but he does not speak Arabic. Now, I'm not going to have time to do this because it's amazing how much time this has already taken and I'm having to pick up the speed here, but on my uh, YouTube channel, uh, I and my Arabic tutor did a, it's about a half hour video where we went through each one of these examples and my Arabic tutor, who was born in Syria, his family is still in Damascus, pray for them, as Christians, they are in grave danger right now. They're right on the border between what's government controlled and, and it's, it's amazing they're still alive, but uh, pray for his family. Uh, but my Arabic tutor and I went through all of these and I would ask him, can you make heads or tails of that? Nothing that you're about to hear is actually Arabic. Uh, but listen to uh, some of his claims and listen to the context in which he places them. And the second thing I got to do was tell my papa I was a born-again Christian. Papa, it's been a lie. Believe in Jesus. Okay. For those of us who speak Arabic, you will listen to Al Jazeera, and you will listen to uh, Arafat, and you will listen to these men who will say, We will push you into, we will push the Jews into the Mediterranean, and then they will turn around in English and say, We want peace. We have a verse in the Quran that says, Allah anturas. Allah has no son. That's not how you say Allah. Allah and Jehovah are not the same. Not by... so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do it in Arabic. You guys don't know Arabic, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it because there's six Muslims who are stationed here all the way along who are listening to everything that is being said, and we're going to tell the story the right way. And they lose their mind when they hear you say Abraham and Isaac. Shut him up! That's not how you say shut him up in Arabic. This is what they are reading. I declare who I will send. That's supposedly what martyrs read. Not even close. They are to divorce. The man, all he has to do is face Mecca and begin the nikah. He disowns her three times. He says, I disown you, I, I divorce you, and you are for divorce. You don't get any land. That's not how you do the divorce. And that's not how you say it in Arabic. One more. Listen to Arabic. The Arabic here says to tap her lightly. And I said, well, first off, yes, I do know the Arabic. And l'chesh means to smack with the open hand. The word to strike your wife in the Quran is not hesh. That's not even an Arabic term. Each one of these, when you listen to the full context, he was plainly claiming to be able to speak Arabic, even though that's not the language in Turkey. He would be speaking Turkish. That's why he told the Turkish reporters that he was born in Sweden. Because if he said he was born in Istanbul and they started speaking Turkish, he wouldn't have had a clue what they were talking about, let alone Arabic. But when he talked about taking students under the dome of the rock, and then explaining in Arabic about Abraham and Isaac. Keep that in mind, because once again, the excuse sheet is going to say, well, not really. He didn't say that. We'll see that in a moment. Now, as a student of, uh, as a student of Islam, 
and many Muslims themselves notice many errors in Cantor's presentations on Islam. His mistakes would not be made by someone who devoutly practiced Islam for 18 years. For example, uh, Cantor would often say Ramadan is 40 days long. Now, if you know what Ramadan is, Ramadan is one is the ninth lunar month in the Islamic calendar. And a lunar month cannot be 40 days long. Uh, if the moon takes 40 days to get around the earth, we've got a real problem, okay? That's, that's, that's not, not, not a good thing. Um, lunar months are, depending on how you count them as to where the, the moon is in the sky and something like that, uh, given their way of observing, 28 to 30 days max. And anyone who observed Ramadan, which you have to fast from before sunrise in the morning till after sunset in the evening, not even drink water, knows exactly how long Ramadan is. Because at the end, you have the equivalent of what might be Christmas for us, for the kids. So especially as a kid, you'd know exactly how long Ramadan was. And yet he over and over again says 40 days, and we're going to say continues to defend that. We're going to see that he continues to defend that. Even to this day, it's an amazing, amazing thing. Uh, he confused the opening of Surah Al-Fatiha with the Shahada. No Muslim who prayed the prayers regularly would ever make that kind of mistake. He often spoke as if his knowledge was second-hand, absorbed in his youth, but not lived daily as he claimed to live it daily as a, as a, uh, a great, uh, devout Muslim. You'll remember that he called his father an ulema. Ulema is the plural of alam. That means he was calling his father a scholar's. There is no such thing. An alim is a, is a scholar, a, 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 a learner, but an ulema, are, the ulema are the body of Islamic scholars. It's not even the right term. Which again, if he actually spoke the language, then he would know that. Then, this was one of the first mistakes that I saw that made me go, watch this. One of our leaders, Shabir Ali, the, the, the debater, is often famous for saying, before he died, saying, that, that, why would one man's death apply to anyone else? Did you catch that? Shabir Ali, our, our leader, Shabir Ali, the great debater, before he died. Um, this is uh, me and Shabir debating in a mosque in Toronto uh, a few years after uh, Ergen Cantor said this. And like I said, I'm debating him in a few weeks. Shabir is fine, thankfully. And... Uh, uh, we're, we're writing a book together. Uh, so he managed to knock off Shabir Ali and say he was dead. Well, at the same time in 2007, he claimed to have debated him twice. So I guess he died somewhere after 2007. I'm not sure. Uh, obviously, what was was he was confusing Ahmed Didat and Shabir Ali. Now, they're not anywhere close to each other in their presentations or anything else. But again, it's just Ergen being Ergen throwing stuff out there, and in the process, making numerous errors. And then there was, and this should be of, of concern for a lot of us, the troubling issue of Cantor's inability to enunciate even basic elements of the concept of Jesus as the Son of God. Now, if this man has been converted, and by the way, when he would say what he said to his father, he said, uh, uh, Isa Messiah, Jesus is Messiah. Every Muslim believes that. His father would not have disowned him for that. In other places, he says, he says, Isa bin Allah. That doesn't mean anything. The word bin is Hebrew. Ch uh, son in Arabic is ibn. It would be Isa ibn Allah, son of God, if that's what he was trying to say. If he was trying to say Jesus is God, it would be Isa hua Allah. But he never says it right. But you would think that a seminary president, professor of apologetics, would be able to give a coherent presentation of the nature of what it means to believe Jesus is the Son of God, especially when you're a former Muslim, because that's one of the primary things that Muslims struggle with. The, Quran does, the author of the Quran did not understand what we believe about Jesus as the Son of God. According to Surah 5116, really the understanding of the Quran is God married Mary and had a kid named Jesus. That's not what Son of God means to us. And you would think after all of these debates, that answering the issue of the Son of God would be easy for a man, but in one of these discussions that was used to be posted on iTunes, he was having a dialogue with a country oneness Pentecostal, an old-time oneness anti-Trinitarian Pentecostal pastor, and the man tied him in knots on this issue. Listen as Ergen Kanner tries to explain how Jesus 
is the Son of God. All right, and please make sure I restate your question correctly. You asked the question, um, if in fact there's always been a Father, always been a Son, and always been a Holy Spirit, and that they didn't have a beginning, they didn't have an end, that they are eternal, um, that how is it that a Father can have a Son who is his same age, uh, that the, both of them have had no beginning? Uh, the sonship of Christ, this is the issue of uh, progressionism in, in Scripture, and it's also the issue of the incarnation, that Jesus is part of the creation, Colossians, uh, again, the, the citation of the plural. You also have the Holy Spirit, who has been eternal, the Spirit moving on the waters. But his sonship comes in incarnation, that when Jesus is incarnate, God the Father sending the Son, it is that moment that the, the term carries with it the, the more than just a metaphor. Now he is the son of the father. He, that's why Jesus says, I have not come to do my will, I've come to do the father's will. He is the second person of the Trinity and always has been. But in terms of when Jesus refers to himself as the son, that's a messianic term. Both son of God and son of man were messianic terms, the fulfillment of prophecy in the Old Testament. And to be fulfilled, the incarnation had to take place. God had to put on flesh. He didn't come to earth to be God he was God before he left. We call it we call it Son any more than trying to understand the Trinity, explain the Trinity, to define the Trinity is impossible. However, we try to do the same with the text. We say, here you got God the Father, who is defined clearly as God the Father. You have God the Son, who is defined clearly as God the Son, and you have God the Holy Spirit, who is defined clearly as God the Holy Spirit. Either God becomes schizophrenic. Again, to take the metaphor. Or we have a superman, or what we call modalism. That is, he's God the Father, goes back in, comes out as the Son, goes back in, comes back as the Spirit. You, the, the problem is you either have what we call the vacant heaven view, or you have a God who is uh, a son who is uh, um, uh, the incarnation of God who is lying about himself and, and calling himself equal when in fact he's just referring to his spirit part but not his flesh. Um, did anybody understand that? I've tried. I've taught systematic theology a number of times. I didn't get it. Um, for someone to be in the position he was in, in that kind of in front of students, and not be able to give a coherent response as to how Jesus is the Son of God and the relationship of the Father and Son in eternity past, absolutely shocking to me. Now I've gone way over my time, and so I need to I need to accelerate here. How has Eric and Cantor gotten away with this? Why is he still teaching? Why has there been no repentance? He has been enabled by many, many others. Liberty refused to do what was right and to uh, acknowledge the errors in his statements. Uh, he has now come here to Texas and is teaching here. But one of the big names that has enabled Ergen Karen to continue on the speaking circuit. He, he teaches for Veritas Seminary, which uh, Dr. Norman Geisler is the dean of, is Norman Geisler. And in 2010, in June of 2010, you can see on the screen an article that was posted. It says July 22nd, 2010, there, 11.36 a.m., Norman Geisler's website, in defense of Dr. Ergen Kanner, response to his critics by Dr. Norman L. Geisler. Now, I do not believe that Dr. Geisler wrote this. His name's on it, so he's responsible for it. If you put it on your website and put your name on it, you're responsible for it, but I don't believe he wrote it for a second. And a couple years ago, we got good evidence that was the case, because after we refuted this material, and I'm going to give you just a few examples, I, I would be here for another hour just going through the absurd nature of the excuses in this list. But after we had refuted it, about two years later, about a year and a half later, we kept we keep going back to Cantor's or to uh, Dr. Geisler's site to see if it was still posted. And then somebody got the idea one day of looking at the subdirectory, and they discovered that Dr. Geisler's site isn't really all that advanced. It was done by this program called Front Page. Anybody remember Microsoft Front Page? And when you go into the subdirectory, what it would do is it would take Word documents and then it would convert it into HTML and post it. But it would leave the Word document in the subdirectory and it was available for public consumption. So we downloaded the Word document, and when you opened the Word document from which this defense of Canner came, and you looked at properties, it says the author is Thomas and the company is Truett McConnell College. 
Anybody know where Truett McConnell College is? Anybody know who the president of Truett McConnell College is? The president of Truett McConnell College is Emir Kanner, Ergen's brother. We had been told that starting about May, uh, March of 2010, there was a, a, piece of, uh, a couple pieces of paper. You could go into Ergen Kanner's office, and you could read his responses. You couldn't take it with you, but you could read his rebuttals of what was being said about him out on the Internet. We think this is what it is, that this, this excuse sheet was produced by the Canners, provided to Dr. Geisler, and now it's posted on his website to where it is to this very day. I'm only going to give you a couple of the egregious, amazing statements and then try to wrap up. Okay? For example, the charge that he could not speak, that he could speak Arabic when he can't. Here's Dr. Geisler's response, which I think, again, is just the Canners' response. He only claims to be able to speak Arabic the way most non Arabic Muslims do. Although he was raised in Sweden by a Swedish mother, actually he wasn't. I mean, if you're three years old when you're in America, that's not being raised in Sweden. Ergen learned enough Arabic, as most Muslims do, to read the Quran and speak it in prayer. He can't read the Quran even in Arabic. Most Muslims can't. Only 19% of the world's Muslims are Arabic and can read the Quran in that language. And that's not what he said, was it? Do you remember what he said? When you listen to Al Jazeera in Arabic, Remember? When you narrate what happened with Abraham and Isaac in Arabic and they get mad at you and yell at you, that's not what he was claiming, was it? No, it's not. And yet that's the excuse being offered. This one is amazing. The charge that Ergen claimed he always lived in a Muslim country before coming to the U.S., although the phrase always lived is not precise. And what does is mean anyways? Although the phrase always lived is not precise, there is no evidence of an evil intent to embellish here, as his critics say. True, Sweden was not a Muslim country, yeah, but he did live as a Muslim with a Muslim father while in Sweden. After all, Ergen's father was from a Muslim country. Ergen was a citizen of a Muslim country because his father was, was Turkish, and he lived as a Muslim in Sweden up till age three, it would be an embellishment to say that if he was not a Muslim and not a citizen of a Muslim country. Now, folks, if that kind of excuse was often offered for Benny Hinn, everybody would laugh at it. When Mormon apologists offer excuses like that for Joseph Smith, we see right through it. But here is Norman Geisler offering that kind of excuse. It was clear, you saw it and I saw it, that when Ergen Kanner said, I always live in the majority Muslim countries, he did it in the context of saying, when I came here as a teenager, I thought you hated me because I didn't know anything about Christians when he had grown up in Ohio. It was a lie. And this is one of the most ridiculous excuses I have ever heard for making a lie. And yet it's still posted on Dr. Geiser's website. Two more. The charge that Cantor claimed Ramadan was 40 days long. Muslims claim this feast is only 30 days long, and Cantor said it was 40 days. Cantor cites Muslim authorities to the contrary, showing it can last up to 40 days. Even the Quran, Surah 251, speaks of 40 days of fasting. What Muslim authority? Never cited, because there are none. There are none. You will not find a Muslim on this planet that will say that anywhere. And Surah 251, does it speak of 40 days of fasting? Well, let's look. Here is Surah 251 in both English and Arabic, and it says, And recall when we made an appointment with Moses for 40 nights, then you took for worship the calf after him while you were wrongdoers. Anything about Ramadan there? That is desperation on a level that is astonishing. And it's on Norman Geisler's website right now. And the Muslims know it. Point to it and laugh hysterically, and they have every right to do so. Because if that kind of silliness was on a Muslim website about alleged former Christian, what would we say? Clear evidence. That guy has no idea what he's talking about. And the last one, my favorite. The charge that no knowledgeable Muslim would miscite the Hadith as Cantor did. 
It is charged that Kanner often cites the Hadith without mentioning the actual name of the collection. But as even Muslim scholars admit, there is no official way to cite the Hadith. It is often cited without reference to the collection. Now, I can understand why most Christians don't get it. Uh, anyone in this room read the Muslim Hadith? Um, there are six authoritative collections for Sunni Muslims. There are different collections for the Shiites. The two most authoritative are Sahih al-Bakari and Sahih Muslim. Sahih al-Bakari is nine volumes. Sahih Muslim is eight volumes. You're looking at one of the few Christians that I know that's read all of them. All of Bakari, all of Muslim. How did I do that? I did it while riding a bike, believe it or not. Don't ask me how to do that. Not right now. But I did. I know the Hadith, the Hadith literature. I'm going to show you a quick, quick, a quick video here where I asked Norman Geisler a question. I asked him this question in July of 2010. He has never responded. He knows of the video. He has never responded because he cannot respond and will never be able to respond. Here is where I explain this issue and challenge him. The final question comes from Dr. Geisler's attempted defense of the errors of uh, Ergen and Emir Kanner in their published writings and in their published talks uh, relating to the Hadith literature of the Islamic religion. I would like to ask Dr. Geisler to answer the following question openly, honestly, and fully. Let's say a student at Veritas Seminary, where you are provost, and where I believe you teach, uh, turns in a paper in an apologetics class that is filled with references such as Bible 135, Bible 452, Scripture 993, and New Testament 267. What would you do with such a paper? And what if, upon challenging the student about such citations, you were informed that there is no one standardized way of citing the Bible, and that the uh, the Bible is often cited without reference to a specific book. H how would you respond to this? Would you accept this kind of argumentation? Uh, would you find it that kind of argumentation so compelling that you would then recommend that the students speak at conferences on the topic of his paper? Now, this is, of course, a direct parallel to Dr. Geiser's attempted response to the miscitation of the Hadith literature the Hadith collections and the writings and talks of Ergen and Emir Kanner. Dr. Geisler's claims that Muslim scholars admit there is no official way of citing the Hadith literature just simply not true. Uh, please name the Muslim scholars who cite Hadith literature without reference to the collection in the way that the Kanners do. I'd like to know who does this with regularity. You say it is often cited without reference to the collection in the majority of references in the book Unveiling Islam, and I will provide the citation. It's already on Church and Fan's blog, but I'll repeat the information. The majority of references in Unveiling Islam, the canners do not provide any reference to the collection. Sahih al-Bakari, Sahih al-Muslim, Jamia Termidi, etc. Uh, I'll provide that list so you can see that it's a rather long list. So, here's my question, Dr. Geiser. This should be an easy one, if your defense is true. Please quote for us Hadith 2425 and explain its relevance to the Quran. You've written, uh, co-authored an entire book on Islam, so this should be easy. Uh, quote for us Hadith 2425 and explain its relevance to the Quran. Now, I have a specific Hadith reference in mind. And it's actually very relevant to an extremely important issue in the Quran. It is. So, quote 2425 for us and tell us how it's relevant to the Quran. If you cannot do so, then please explain your defense of Ergen and Emir Kanner's use of a citation system that cannot lead one to the proper citation. Instead, you simply have to guess. I mean, there's a limited number of Hadith collections. So you could guess and have about 15% chance of getting it right, maybe. Maybe a little better than that. But uh, please, please do this for us. So there you go. 
you basically have men writing books where they are quoting, it's like, it's like a former Christian who would quote the Bible as Bible 316. Can you find Bible 316? Oh, sure, for God's love, how do you know that's it? There's a 1 Timothy 316, it's very important. There's a 2 Timothy 316, it's very important. There's a 1 Peter 316, it's very important. You see, it's, it's irrational. Absolutely irrational. And as I said, this is also the same excuse sheet that said that, well, you know, Cantor said that his father had many wives. Well, he did remarry, so he had two. That's not what Cantor meant. Recently, as the pastor mentioned when we started, Ergen went on a Twitter attack. This is from his website. You may notice from his, his tweet page, Provost Dean at J. Frank Norris, humbled before God, defiant before Pharisees, innocent before the consistory, bullies and trolls, I fight back. Hmm. Listen to some of the things he said. Okay, you're proving my point. The only people who thought I was guilty are the hypers, hyper-Calvinists, and their Muslim partners. The rest see what it was. One final before I'm done. Never defend against false accusations. Jesus never did. I won't either. Have a nice day. He didn't stop there, however. He continued on. He said, yep, once again you prove my point. Paul stood against governors, those accusing me, not governors, not even close. I pay no heed to that little cadre of people. They're neither colleagues, professors, nor friends. Those that are found me what? Innocent. He claims to be innocent. He says, no need to prove anything, certainly not you. Against, again, three schools looked at it all, finding exonerated. And I also have definitive video proving we didn't land on the moon and 9-11 was caused by aliens. So those videos of me saying that stuff, you know, don't have to worry about that stuff at all. Well, this has been fun, he says, but I must get home. In summation, I categorically deny the charges and those who brought them, and I shall keep doing exactly what I've been doing for decades, humble before God and unrepentant before the Calvin boys. There is encounter. Why does it matter tonight? Reason number one, the pulpit is to be honored. The ministry is to have integrity. And Christian apologetics to Muslims is to be based upon truth, not upon falsehood. Eric Cantor stood behind pulpits in Christian churches, including this pulpit in this place. Was it this pulpit? Not that particular pulpit? Well, okay. He stood behind the pulpit in this place, and he promulgated those myths. You know what the sad thing is, folks? His story was a good story. The reality was a good story. Broken home, nominal Muslim, led to Christ, tried to witness to his dad. You see, he decided that wasn't enough. He decided that wasn't good enough. He had to puff it out, had to make it better. What does that say to people who actually have a testimony like that? You know how many former Muslims who have come to know Christ have talked to me and Ergen Cantor has been used against them when they give their testimony. Oh, you're a former Muslim that came to Christ, well, like Ergen Cantor, right? We don't live on islands, folks. We don't live on islands. The Muslims have seen this. Yes, thankfully, I have had some Muslims contact me and say, I thank you for standing up and doing the right thing here. But folks, there's not a lot of folks here tonight. There were a lot of folks in those churches that Eric and Cantor talked to. They know that some of us have tried to do what's right, but you can't expect Muslims to differentiate between Christians very well. And they look at Eric and Cantor and they see all of us. And one of the worst things is, Eric and Cantor often speaks the truth, and then he immediately associates it with a lie. Remember the stuff he said about Shabir Ali, Abdul Salib, and Nader Ahmed? What was the next words out of his mouth? They were saying that one man can't die for me. They were, they were talking about, and you know what? That is what Muslims say. Isn't it a shame Ergen Kander didn't just do the work to actually talk to the Muslims to have them say that? 
when you associate lies with the truth, you dishonor the truth. And that's the real issue here. As I said, I debate Shabir Ali. I'll be debating him twice in a few weeks. I can't look him in the eye and say that I'm being truthful if I do not expose Ergen Kanner, because he knows now that Ergen Kanner has claimed to debate him. I have to be consistent. We all have to be consistent. One more thing. When Christians lie, people may well die. I didn't use any of the video from this, because right now Ergen Kanner is suing Jason Smathers, a Christian pastor, in a court of law for copyright violation. Why? Because Jason Smathers filed a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act request, where he obtained videos of two sessions that Ergen Kanner did with Marines. Says right on the discs as they came from the Marines, no copyright. But Ergen Kanner is claiming copyright and suing Jason Smathers for posting them online. Now, I have reviewed the audio on the dividing line. You can go listen. Same lies that we've already listened to over and over again this evening. Same lies there. But here he is, standing in front of an entire room of Marines. They go out to places like Afghanistan, pretending to be a former jihadist and telling them about the mindset of a jihadist when he's a kid that grew up in Ohio. Do you see the danger here, my friends? Do you see the danger here? There's a book called Why Churches Die, Diagnosing Lethal Poisons in the Body of Christ from 2005. And on page 208 it says, public sin, public confession. That is, when you have a public sin, there needs to be public confession of that sin. It can't just be done in private. It can't be just put under a rug. Ergen Kanner made these claims in public. He needs to confess in public and admit that all the excuses he's been offering are just that. They are nothing but excuses. You know what the irony is, folks? They're the authors of the book. Mac Brunson, Arrogant Canner. Scriptures are clear. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, do not admit a charge against an elder except in the evidence of two or three witnesses. We have provided a whole lot more than two or three witnesses tonight. And most of them have been Eric and Canner himself. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. Oh, we should just do it in private. You should have done Matthew 18. Matthew 18 is about personal sins between individuals. Many people have gone to Eric and Canner in private. He refuses to repent. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Purity of the gospel is at stake. Oh no, not that Aaron Kander can destroy the gospel. But the Muslim world's watching. And only a few of us have been willing to say, no, no. That is not what represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And we will stand consistently with that truth. Now, I have gone pretty much as long as I can go, uh, as far as time goes. I'd hope to have some time for questions. Um, and in fact, we have about five minutes, I would guess. If you would like to ask questions of me, I'd be glad to answer. If there are any questions that you would like to have a point of clarification, or if you would like to say, you shouldn't have done that, I'll be happy to respond to that. Does anyone have a question you'd like to ask? Yes, sir. In regards to the Department of Defense, uh, being that he did speak to soldiers in terms of training, are they pursuing that in the question is asked, uh, is the Department of Defense pursuing anything in regards to Cantor's appearance before the Marines? No, they are not. Um, why? I don't know. My assumption is that, that uh, he got that opportunity to do that because of fairly high-ranking people who knew about him, and they're probably rather embarrassed that they had him, and so it's probably just 
go away. It's not, it's not talking about it. Yeah. There's, there's been no actions that I'm aware of at all. Yes, sir. Oh, he has, he has a perfectly valid degree from a South African university. Uh, interestingly enough, he, he recently claimed to have a PhD in global apologetics. He does not. His, his PhD uh, dissertation was on a specific element of uh, medieval Islam. Um, it's not in comparative religions or, or anything like that at all, but he, uh, I have never questioned the validity of his degrees. I do question the validity of his scholarship because he just simply does not accurately study the subjects that he addresses. He's just sloppy. Um, but uh, never question that it's, I've, you've heard me refer to him a number of times as Dr. Cantor this evening. I have no question about that. Yes, same for his brother. Remember, Emir has not made the claims that Ergen did, but Emir knows the truth of all of this, and he will not speak. So I consider him to be uh, an accomplice in that in that way, and he could clear all he could clarify all of this instantly if he wanted to do so. Yes, sir. Slowly. In reality, the statement released by Liberty University, and there's, a, there's full discussion of this on my blog if you want to go back to it, was the consummate political statement. Uh, I think it was meant to protect the university against the possibility of lawsuit. Uh, and uh, they said they, they found factual misstatements, but no falsehoods. What's the factual misstatement, anyways? Um, they used the, the quintessential example of political ways of explaining that his contract simply wasn't renewed, uh, then he was teaching for a while, and now he came here to Arlington uh, Baptist College. Um, so I can't speak for, for Liberty. Feel free to ask them. Uh, I doubt you're going to get much of an answer. Uh, said Dean and Provost uh, up on, the, uh, on his Twitter uh, page. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Anyone else? One more. What brought him to preeminence? Basically, like I said, before 9-11, before he was Butch Canner. He went by the name Butch. Very shortly, I'm not sure the date, uh, was it First Baptist Jacksonville? Or was it First Baptist in Dallas? Okay. Um, shortly after 9-11, all of a sudden he is asked to speak at a very, very large Baptist church. And this story starts to develop. And because of the fact that it was post 9-11. I mean, all of us are sitting around going, how and why did they do this? Here comes someone who says, I was trained in this. I know this. It's my background, and I'm a Christian now. And there was a real thirst for that. He's not the only one who's done this, by the way, in the sense of cashed in on the hysteria and, unfortunately, ignorance on the part of many Christians. I'm gonna, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I've been doing a lot of radio and, and stuff recently because my book came out in, uh, when did it come out? May or something like that. And I, I have been pushed by people on radio programs to say things I simply cannot say. I try to tell folks, we should not know what we know about Islam from Fox News. We as Christians should have a theological understanding of Islam and recognize they lump us all into one group and you know what, we return the favor. And that's wrong. That's not how we should do things. We need to recognize the difference amongst Muslims. We need to recognize there are many Muslims that do not want to kill us. And because we don't do that, we're afraid of them and therefore we don't witness to them. And I try to make the proper distinctions. And if you read my book, my book is not some screed. It's not you know, I, when I talk about Muhammad and Aisha, I put it in the proper context. It's actually much more important to look at Muhammad and Zainab bin Jash than Muhammad and Aisha because of the historical context. I try to be fair and bend over backwards to be fair in my accurate representation of the Islamic faith. That's not what you get from the canners. That's not what you get from the canners. But unfortunately, that's what a lot of evangelicals want. And that's why he still gets to travel and do the things that he does, sadly. So, folks, I hope you hear. 
it's the good old boy network. There are lots of, lots of churches that are still willing. The, the amazing thing is, since 2010, when they travel, almost never can you actually find their sermons online. They're even either marked not recorded or deleted uh, because they know we're listening, and so they're not even put online. In fact, we've had people at churches tell them that when they, part of their rider, part of their agreement to come, is they don't even promote the event. Uh, they just sort of come in, do their thing, and leave. And uh, sometimes the times aren't announced. And I, I cannot imagine what it's like to live in that way. And it, it to me, is a clear recognition of guilt when you, when you uh, exist in that way. But, but that's what's, go what's going on. Folks, I hope you hear my heart. I wish I was not standing up here. I wish I wasn't. I wish I did not have to deal with this issue, but I hope you hear my heart. I have to because this is what I do. This is what I am engaged in. And when I meet with these Muslim apologists and I try to get to know them and I try to share my heart with them, at least I can look them in the eye and say, you know what? I've paid the price amongst my own people. There are a lot of doors closed in my face because I have dared to question one of the up and rising stars in evangelicalism but can someone tell me what choice I have? Biblically, honestly, as a Christian, as an apologist and as a minister, what choice did I have? What choice does any of us have? What are going to be the ramifications of this evening? I don't know. I leave them in God's hands. I've spoken the truth. The facts are right there. Examine them fairly. And my prayer is that God will bring Ergen Canner and Emir Kanner to repentance. That they will make confession, that they will tell, they will answer all the questions that they will not answer to this day. They will repudiate the documents on Norman Geisler's website. And they will say, we beg forgiveness not only of the Christian people we deceive, but of the Muslim people as well. We do not represent the gospel to you. We did not do it right. Forgive us and let us talk to you about the forgiveness that is in Jesus. That is my hope and prayer. Let's close with a word of prayer. Indeed, our Heavenly Father, as we have gathered this evening and we have sought to honor your gospel and your truth, we would pray that in this situation, your people would stand up for the truth, that they would honor the gospel ministry in the pulpit, they would honor the effort to reach out to the Muslim people, and that the impact of Ergen Kanner's deceptions would be minimized, and in fact, that you would turn it to your honor and glory through his confession and his repentance and his restoration. But Lord, if that's not forthcoming, protect your people from those who would prey upon them. And for those of us who are involved in directly reaching out to the Muslims, may we not be hindered. May we not be hindered by those who have sought to, in any way, profit or promote themselves to the detriment of the gospel. Bless your missionaries this day. Bless every Christian who suffers the name of Christ in a Muslim land, even this day. May the name of Jesus Christ be glorified in all things, for we pray in his name. Amen. I know that... Uh... We are appreciative of you being here tonight, and feel free to thank him for that. Well, I just want to close with this word of Scripture, and then you can be dismissed. I think that we always want to remember that we are not gathered here tonight out of any type of personal moral superiority. Uh, we need to all be reminded of the deceitfulness of sin and how it can grip our hearts. And I pray that we would be a people in God's church who would constantly be doing exactly what the Hebrews author says we should be doing and why our hearts should be heavy and burdened. And as Dr. White has prayed for the canners, that they be delivered from their own deceitfulness of sin, their own sin. Listen to this word from Hebrews 3.12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leaving, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For if we have come to share in Christ, if for we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, 
do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So we pray that their hearts will be, their lives will be rescued from this hardened state and that they will repent. And we pray for a church that will quit covering up these things and will deal with it in an honest fashion. Thank you, Dr. White. And uh, thank you all for being here tonight and you're dismissed. I want to remind you about tomorrow night as well, 6.30.